Saxon Advanced Mathematics Lesson 72. I'm so excited for this lesson. I'm so excited for this lesson. I teased it to you way back in Algebra 2 Lesson 43. So that was a long time ago and we're finally at this point. Um, let me do a little bit of foundation building before we jump in. Algebra 2 Lesson 43 is where we began our study of trigonometry. The trigon part stands for three angles. Triangles, right? And the metri part suggests measuring. And we have indeed been studying trigonometry, which is the study of the measures of triangles. All right, and what I told you way back at the beginning was that we were restricting our study to right triangles. So here are a couple right triangles that we're gonna talk about. And what we learned is that every triangle has six parts. It has three sides and it has three angles. And that adds up to a total of six parts. And what we found is that we can, given the right information, we can quote unquote solve a right triangle, meaning we can find all six parts if we have, I'm gonna tell you what we need. To solve a right triangle, that means to find all six parts, we need one side and then one more side, side or an angle. Okay, these are the two things we need. One side for sure, and then one more piece of information, either a side or an angle, all right? Uh, and I can show you that that's true. Let's say that we have one side and one angle. We know that we can use trig functions with this to find the other pieces. Like for here, what I would do, and there's different ways you can use the information, but I would say, oh, the cosine of 50 degrees is gonna be four, the adjacent over H, the hypotenuse. So for this one, I would do cosine of 50 degrees equals four over H. And then I could cross multiply and rearrange this so that I got H equals four over the cosine of 50 degrees. That's how the algebra would let me do that. Then I could solve for H and I would be off to the races, right? I could do lots of other things from there. So this is an example of one side and one angle. What if we had one side and another side, but we didn't have any angles? Well, according to my list here, we should still be able to solve it. And we see, yeah, we could do cosine of x degrees equals adjacent four over five, right? We could do it that way. <clears throat> and then we would use the inverse cosine function button on our calculator. We'd reduce this to a decimal, it would be 0.8, and then we'd hit second and then we'd hit this button, and that would give us the angle, right? So I'm just reminding you of times when we have been able to solve right triangles using either 
a pair of sides or one side and one angle, all right? We have to have at least one side in order to make it work. Okay, so this is what we already know. This is what we've been doing. And reminder, this has been with right triangles, right? Okay, so all of this information applies to right triangles. Let's turn the page into our new lives as people who talk about trig functions for what we call oblique, which is to say not right. triangles. Up until now, starting with that lesson 43, back in Algebra 2, I've always told you that trig functions apply to right triangles only. But when I first told you that, I said the day is going to come when we learn how to use trig functions for other kinds of triangles, and my friends, that day is here. So let's look at how that works. Let me draw a non-right triangle. None of those angles are right angles. We're going to call them A, B, and C, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to call the side of the triangle that is opposite each angle. So this is angle A. This is the side opposite. We're going to call that the lowercase letter of the same letter, right? So that'll be A. B, angle B is connected with this side, so that's side B. And C goes with C. This is the frustrating one because a little C looks like a big C. So what I usually do is I give my big C's a special loop-de-doop on top. Notice that the angles are all uppercase and the corresponding sides are the matching letter, right? A, B, and C, except the sides are lowercase letters and the angles are uppercase. Okay. To solve, an oblique, fancy name for right, not right, triangle, what do we need? We need one side, and then we need two other parts. Okay, so this is a little different. When we were solving the right triangles, let me flip back to that list. To solve a right triangle, we need one side and then just one more piece, either one other side or one other angle. To solve an oblique triangle, we still have to start with one side, but then we need two other parts, not one other part, two other parts. So we need a little more information, but we have a new tool to use. Uh, because we can't use trig functions in the traditional way since these aren't right triangles, but this is a tool we can use. Let me write it down. This is called the law of signs. What we're doing is we're creating fractions of the side over the sine of the angle, right? This side over the sine of this angle, this side over the sine of this angle, is this part, and then here, this side over the sine of that angle. Notice that these three things are equal. We don't have to have all three of them. We can have any two. This is just the easiest way to write out the whole thing. And again, this is called the law of signs and we use any two parts of this formula right we can make the a's equal to the c's we can make the a's equal to the b's or we can make the b's equal to the c's whichever pieces we have we can take any two of them and create a proportion solve it and go from there all right 
So we don't have to set up all three of them, just any two out of the three. This is the, called the law of sines. This is the way we can use trig functions, specifically sine, to solve a triangle that is not a right triangle. All right, I'm going to take this to the next page. You make sure that you get this copied into your notes. It wouldn't hurt Make sure you get all of this copied too, right? Because this is how we compare the way we've been using trig functions to the way we are now using, we're now going to start using them, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a chance to copy any of this into your notes that you didn't get. I'll pause for a second and you can pause the whole thing if you need to. All right, and now I'll give you a moment to pause me and copy this before we get into using the law of signs. Okay, we have how many examples in this lesson? One, two, three. All right, you will want your scientific calculator handy so that we can calculate some trig functions here. Example 72.1, solve this triangle for the unknown parts. And we remind ourselves, oh yeah, there's always six total. Three angles, three sides. All right, this is angle A, this is angle B. Again, we're using uppercase. This is angle C, but we get a number here, 23 degrees. And then the sides, we have a seven here. I like to circle those and attach them to the line. It just helps me see it better. This is 10. And this is an X down here. So John's not calling them A, B, and C in this one. All right, fine, we can roll with that. Um, what are the rules for solving an oblique triangle? We have to have Excuse me while I yawn. I'm not bored, trust me. We have to have one side. Okay, we have one side here. And then we have to have two other parts. And we have one other side and an angle. So that we have a total of three, we're good. All right, so how are we going to start setting up these proportions? I'm gonna rewrite our law of signs. And again, we don't have to have all three. We have to have, we can create any two of these together. And just like we often do in proportion problems, we're looking for an anchor proportion. If we can find an angle and its corresponding side where we have solid numbers for both, it's gonna make our job a lot easier. So, we only have one angle. So I'm praying that we have the side opposite and look we do. So this will be our anchor proportion. Seven over the sine of 23 degrees is gonna be where we start. Now I will just remind you that we can't get the angles by subtracting from 180 because we only have one out of the three and they add up to 180, yeah, but we don't know how to split those out. So that's not gonna work. All right, so let's start by doing it with this angle. Let's say this equals 10 over the sine of A degrees. Okay, so then what do we do? Well, let's cross multiply. Whenever we have fraction equals fraction, it's a great idea to cross multiply. So we'll get seven times the sine of A degrees equals 10 times the sine of 23 degrees. Here's my variable. So I'm gonna divide both sides by seven to get rid of that. And we'll get the sine of A degrees equals 10 times the sine of 23 degrees over seven. This we can take into the calculator and simplify 
So we'll do 23 degrees times, no, 23 degrees, then push the regular sign button, times 10, divided by seven, and then when we get that all reduced to a decimal, then we'll do second, and sine of minus one. Remember, this is the button we use when we know the decimal, which we return this into a decimal number, and we want the degrees, okay? That's what these inverse buttons do for us. Seeing that minus one makes many, many, many a student think that this is the reciprocal function because minus one means, right, push it. It's a trapeze, they see that as a trapeze. No, the calculator maker guys, the people who designed the buttons for the calculators weren't thinking that way. They were just trying to find a way to say, hey, here's a different way to use sign, inverse sign. That's what this button is called. And don't let that minus one fool you. It's what the button we use when we know the degrees and we can, or the decimals rather, sorry, I said the wrong thing. When we know the decimal and we can reduce this to a decimal number and we want the degrees, that's what we would be going for. And what we get is that the angle here, A, equals 33.93 degrees. So this angle equals 33.93 degrees. Okay, great. Now, we have to consider something that's tricky kind of tricky. We have to consider the idea there, there are actually two angles that would measure out at 33.93 degrees. Let me flip over here. Sine is positive in the first and the second quadrant. So it could be this angle, 33.93, right? Yeah. Or it could be this angle, right? It could be all the way to here. This could be the full angle of the triangle that we're talking about. It would still measure out as this many degrees and we would have to subtract it from 180 and find that is 146.07 degrees. So how do we know? this? It could be 33.93, it could be just a little cute angle like this, or it could be a bigger one that goes all the way over to there. That angle, this 146 degree angle, would have the same sine value and so how do we know which one it is? This is called, this is a problem with the law of signs. It leads to what we call ambiguous results. Okay, the number, the numbers that we used led to two values for an angle and we have to figure out which is correct. Now, the good news is with this angle, we can tell by looking at the picture, right? Our two angles are 146 and 33. Because John gave us a picture, we can clearly see that this is not a 146 degree angle. And so we can make the assumption that it's a 33.93. In problems where John doesn't give us a picture, we'll have a different 
situation on our hands. But for now, we can see, oh yeah, that's, a, that's the smaller of the two angles. It doesn't go out like this, right? Um, so we can conclude it's 33 and we can discard the other result, okay? We can use, possible, we can use the diagram to help us answer the question as long as that's possible. If John doesn't draw us a diagram, then we've got bigger problems. Okay, so let's go back to our original problem. See what we've got. We now have two of the angles, so now we can do the old 180 minus, right? So let's use that. Flipping ahead. So let's see, our total, it's 180 degrees minus the two angles that we have, which let's see, the one that we started with was 23 degrees. And then the one we just did was 33.93. What the heck, let's leave all those decimal in there. Um, this will give us angle B. Okay, and so angle B works out to, when I do that subtraction, it's 123.07. Okay, I'm gonna redraw the triangle so I don't have to keep flipping back every hot minute. So it was like this. This was our 23 degree angle. We called this one A, we called this one B. Uh, this side was 10. This side was seven, and we figured out that this was 33.93. Okay, so what we did was we figured out B by saying 180 minus that minus that. So B equals 123.07 degrees. Let's put degrees on all of those. Okay, good. So we can use our other tools, right? We can use the fact that these add up to 180. We cannot use Pythagorean theorem because Pythagorean theorem only works for right triangles. Bummer. So in order to find this missing side, we're going to have to set up another one of our law of sines proportions. Let's use the same starting one, seven over the sine of 23 degrees. That will be our anchor. I would rather not use this one. We could use 10 over the sine of 33.93. I don't wanna do that. This will be equal to some number, we'll call it X, because that's what John calls it. He calls this X, over the sine of 123.07 degrees, all right? When we have the variable up here, our calculation is a bit simpler. All we have to do is cross multiply and then divide away the part that's by the X and we will get seven times the sine of 123.07 degrees divided by the sine of 23 degrees. That will be equal to X. That is a lot of button pushing, but we can do it, right? 123.07 sine times seven divided by parentheses, 23 sine and parentheses equals. Using parentheses is a gift. Once you figure it out, you'll be happy. X equals 15.01. That seems perfectly logical. When we look at our answers, we feel good about uh, the calculations we're making. Let me go back and box all my answers. Angle B is 123.07, side X is 15.01, and then A was the other thing we calculated. I just wanna make sure I got the right answers all the way through. But I know I did because This is where we chose A, right? 
We were looking at our ambiguous results. So here's the takeaway I want you to have. When, sorry. This was our formula when we, uh, right here, this was the beginning of our, this is where we set up our first proportion. Notice that the variable is in the denominator. That is when we get the ambiguous results. When variable is in denominator, okay? This is a very important hint I'm giving you. When you notice that your variable is in the denominator, that's when you go, oh, I need to worry about that whole dumb, ambiguous results thing. When the variable This was our second law of science calculation. When the variable is in the numerator, no ambiguous results. When variable is in the numerator. And whenever I teach this part, um, do you guys remember, it was way before your time, back in the days when everybody was like on MSN and doing the chats, you know, the, the old fashioned online chats, it probably seems very prehistoric for you. And that was in the days when everybody said you should never use your actual name online. And so everybody made up you know, clever, they all tried to be, you know, clever and artistic online handles, right? Because you wouldn't ever want to use your real name. Um, one of my daughters used the name Ambiguous Reason as her MSN chat name. And that, I always think of it when we talk about this. Ambiguous Reason was her name. Um, okay, so that's how we use the law of signs. We use it to solve for missing parts. Um, we used it to find this angle and we used it to find this side. Once we found this angle though, we didn't need it to find the third angle. We could have used it to find the third angle, but it's easier just to subtract, all right? So there is the law of signs at work. These problems are long, you guys, because we're finding a lot of different parts and finding each part requires steps. Ay, yeah, yeah, right? So let's try one more and then, no, we have two more, don't we? Oh my gosh, yes, we do. Okay, I won't have to explain as much this time. Solve the missing trial. Triangle, sorry, I can't speak. I can only do math. This time we have a triangle that looks like this. Oh, hmm, this is going to be useful, I think, when we, if we get an ambiguous result, we know we have this big fat angle in here. All right, we'll keep that in mind. This angle is A. Oh, this is 23 degrees. Look, you guys. This is the very same triangle as we did last time. 23 degrees here, seven here, 10 here. What that means is that, let's go ahead and set up the first proportion just like we did last time. We had uh, seven and 23 degrees, seven over the sine of 23 degrees equals 10 over the sine of A degrees, right? And we're trying to find angle A. Notice our variable is in our denominator. That's our sign, to, or our, I don't wanna say sign, our reminder that we're gonna have an ambiguous result. We did this calculation in the last problem. Let me go find it. We did this exact same calculation. Now I'll put it back once I find it, yes. We found out that it, the calculator gives us a result of A being equal to 33.93 degrees. You can do it again if you don't remember, or trust me, 
um, but we did that. But then we said we had to consider the two ambiguous, the, the two results, right? Because it's ambiguous. And we decided that if this result could either mean this angle or it could mean over here, which would give us a 146 degree angle, much bigger. And we see, oh, in this triangle, we would want to choose, see it's 146.07. I'm mentally subtracting this from 180 to get that, right? We did it over here. And so now I'm showing you how it would work over here. This time, based on the diagram, we can, I just wanna write ambiguous, results. This time we can see that our picture is indicating that A is this one. So we're going to choose 146.07 degrees in this uh, picture because this angle does not look like a 33 degree angle, does it? It looks like a 146er. So this time we interpret our ambiguous results differently we choose the larger angle rather than the smaller angle, which is what the previous diagram indicated. Again, if we don't have a picture, we have to handle this situation differently. We'll cover that in a future lesson. Okay, so now when we wanna get angle B, this one, we do 180 minus, and it's the 23 degree angle plus the 146.07 degrees, okay? And that will equal 10.93 degrees for B. And that looks about right For this diagram, doesn't it? This should be a pretty tiny little angle. These two should be roughly the same. This one is fat. So we trust our numbers to line up with what the diagram is showing us. Okay, beautiful. Our last step is to find this side. In the picture, John's calling it X, just like before. So this time we'll use our same original anchor proportion, even though now if we wanted, we could use 10 over the sine of 146.07. But let's stick with this one. We'll use that as our anchor. Seven over the sine of 23 degrees equals, and we're trying to get this and this, so it'll be X over the sine of 10.93 degrees, right? This is the other pair that we're using and we're just hoping to solve for X. Okay, so there we are, we're all set up. Notice this time we see the variable is in the numerator, yay, no ambiguous results, we don't have to worry about that. We simply cross multiply, cross multiply, we cross multiply and then we'll divide away the part so X is by itself. Shove it into the calculator here, let me just show you. It would be, it would be X equals seven times the sine of 10.93 divided by the sine of 23 degrees and that would give us a value for X of equal to 3.40, okay? Again, you'll need parentheses to do the bottom part of that. It may take you a little fiddling around. Remember that if you ever get frustrated with your calculator, Google for a tutorial or something like that. Um, look around online, you can find people who can teach you how to use your specific calculator. If you're befuddled, also you can always reach out to me when we video chat and just ask me to show you how to do it. Um, Cause there's nothing worse than when it's the calculator that's causing you drama. 3.40, yeah, that seems reasonable. If this side is seven and this side is 10, this, I've probably drawn it a little bit bigger. If you look at the diagram in the book, this side is a little bit shorter. Um, but there's our right answer. And so we found all six parts of the triangle, right? We've got all three angles and all three sides. 
and we dealt with that crazy ambiguous reason thing. It's not ambiguous reason, that's my daughter's name. Ambiguous results. Okay, one more. I'm almost to the end of this crazy little foldy book. Ready? Example 72.3. Okay, we have a different triangle this time. It's oblique, it is not a right triangle. Here we have one of the sides. Remember, we have to have one side. And then we need two other pieces. And in this case, John has given us two of the angles. Okay, as soon as I see that I have two of the three angles, I get really excited because A has to be equal to 180 minus these two together, 30 plus 50. So A equals 100 degrees. And we can put that in. I find it helpful to write what I know on the triangle. It helps me keep track of what information I have and what I'm still looking for. So now we've got all three angles. This is degrees. Um, and now we're ready to find some sides. We're gonna need to use the law of sines to do that. Remember, we cannot use Pythagorean because that only works for right triangles. So, bummer, we can't use him. Um, but we can see, okay, here's our anchor proportion. Here's where we have a match. So we're gonna say seven over the sine of 30 degrees equals, oh, let's do, let's do this one first. M over the sine of 50 degrees. And then we can do the other one. This will be one of our sides. And then the other side calculation. I'll leave us some room to work. But what I'm doing, and I like to do this in when I'm actually, you know, if I was a student doing my homework, get up, do all the writing first, then pick up your calculator and run all your calculations at once. Then I'm going to use my same anchor proportion, 7 over the sine of 30 degrees, and then I'm going to set that up to solve for k, which will be k over the sine of 100 degrees. Great. Oh, and then before I pick up my calculator also, I'm going to cross and multiply and divide away so that m's by itself. 7 times the sine of 50 degrees over the sine of 30 degrees equals m. And then the same here, the same here. This is going to go up, and this will stay in the bottom. It will be 7 times the sine of 100 degrees divided by the sine of 30 degrees equals K. I'll point out what I didn't point out earlier, and that is that our variable is in the numerator. So that means we don't have to worry about ambiguous results. And I'll also point out that when the variable is in the numerator, that means it represents a side. When the variable is in the denominator, that means it represents an angle. It's the angles that can be ambiguous. The sides are never ambiguous. So you can use that rule of variable in the numerator is A-OK, -okay, variable in the denominator is ambiguous. But remember that we're also talking about sides always being in the numerator and angles always being in the denominator, okay? So that's how that rule works. When you run this through the calculator, your value for M should be 10.72. I don't know if I'm boxing or squiggling. And K will be equal to 13.79. Okay, and I'm gonna write them here just so I can see everything together. 10.72, 13.79. This side is seven, yeah, that looks reasonable. If you look at the picture in the book, it comes out a little bit more. So it makes even more sense. These numbers make a little more sense. 
And the angles look good too, don't they? They seem reasonable. So, plus they're right. I have the answers open in front of me, so I'm not worried. Okay, that is the end of this lesson. That is the law of signs. That is how we can use at least one of the trig functions. Spoilers, there's a law of cosines too, but we're not talking about it yet. So right now we've only learned how to use one of the trig functions in triangles that are not right triangles. And we call those oblique, right? That's just a fancy word that means not a right triangle. So we can, under very special circumstances, we can use at least one trig function in a non-right triangle. And these are happy days, you guys. Like I said, it was lesson 43 of Algebra 2 when I first told you that trig functions maybe could work in non-right triangles, but that it would be a long time before we talked about that. Well, the day has come. Yay. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Goodbye.